The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to the Ask the Expert show on W4CY Radio and Talk 4 TV, where we bring you educational information from top local experts in the fields of legal, health, financial, and home improvement. Now sit back and listen to experts in family law, association law, hearing loss, business brokers, home care, along with many other topics. Now here are your hosts, Steve-O and Sophia. Good morning, Philadelphia. Welcome to the Ask the Experts show. And as always, our shows are sponsored by the Michael Cardamone Law Firm. He's a certified specialist in workers' comp law. His phone number is 215-206-9068. We have got a great show for you today. We are talking workers' comp law. And... Folks, let me tell you, I've been doing this for 12 years now. And when you have an attorney that devotes his entire practice to one area of law, I'm telling you, that is the way I would always go. And so let me introduce you now, our expert in workers' comp law, certified specialist, Michael Cordemon. Good morning, Steve. How are you? I'm good. I have to get used to saying certified specialist because in other markets, it's board certified. Yeah, and there's also board certification for doctors, so it can be confusing. But for workers' comp in Pennsylvania, if you pass the exam and and, uh, meet all the other criteria, then, you know, you're a certified specialist in workers' comp. So the phrase is actually longer than that. We're supposed to use... uh, it's a certified specialist uh, through the Pennsylvania Bar Association as approved by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, but we kind of abbreviate it because that's a mouthful. So, <laughs> Well, Michael, you know what? We, we get new people every week joining our show. And tell people, first of all, about your firm. Sure. So as Steve said, we are 100% focused on workers' comp for injured workers, making us pretty rare uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. There's a few other firms that that focus 100% on comp, but not too many. And uh, so we're a small boutique firm. We have two attorneys and a great staff. Uh, We're bilingual with Spanish. Uh, We have offices in Lansdale and Philadelphia primarily, but also some space in the Lehigh Valley and uh, and Lancaster as well. So uh, we're always happy to meet with our clients where they reside or they can come to us or we can do a Zoom call. We're really flexible with that, whatever makes our clients comfortable. And uh, so we've been around since 2014 and uh, our recipe works. You know, people come to us when they have serious injuries, they know that we're no nonsense and we don't handle lots of different areas of law. It's just workers comp only with us. Michael, where do you see most of your, your clients coming from? Is it in the construction area? It's really diversified, uh, but that is definitely one really ripe area um, of the economy where we get clients, construction cases, truck drivers, um, still some assembly line workers, Amazon workers, for example, a lot of healthcare workers, nurses. CNAs, uh, people like that, but it could be, you know, I've, I've represented a pharmacist before, tripped on a computer wire, then had a bad concussion and had a really serious brain injury. Uh, so it really can, can really run the whole gamut, but yeah, 80, 90% of the time it's in a, in a field where it's really hands-on warehouse workers, the construction workers, et cetera. I started off today's show with good morning, Philadelphia, because we've done that for the last 12 years, but it's no longer good morning, Philadelphia. It's good morning, Pennsylvania. We now 
cover all of Pennsylvania, not just Philadelphia. So we didn't mean to leave anybody out. It's just after 12 years of doing this, I am so used to saying good morning, Philadelphia. So, hey, let's just jump in the, right in. And I've got so many questions for you, Michael. And But I'm going to start off first because one of the biggest questions is people who are injured don't understand how you get paid. Yeah, it's a contingent fee system. And what that means is you, you don't pay us anything out of your pocket. No check, no cash, no Venmo, nothing. And uh, if we win and there's a court order approving our victory or settlement, then there'll be a 20% award. My firm only takes an award on the indemnity or wage loss benefits. There are some firms now that are uh, taking a fee on medical. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that, so we don't we do not do that. But uh, So, yeah, it's you don't need any cash. It levels the playing field and allows you to get representation uh, without having to send us any checks. And people who do that tend to double or triple their money. And so uh, sometimes they fear this 20%. Well, I can't live on my check as is, and I'm going check to check, and it's really hurt hurting us. But when the insurance company challenge your benefits and they say you're recovered, for example, and you lose, you get nothing. So I have to explain to our clients that you can get a 20% reduction if you fight back and win, or you can get zero. And so it's an obvious choice and with settlement people do much better too with an attorney on their side so it is the number one question it's how do i pay you i can't afford it and we say well you're in good luck you know you don't have to pay us anything it's a contingent and that's across the board that's across the state um so it's a really nice way for people to to level the playing field because the insurance companies they know what they're doing they have a team of attorneys and you want to have the same thing on your side Exactly. And these attorneys on the other side, these aren't slouches. These are boy, these are big hitters and they gobble up people who don't have an attorney. Now here you've got like, just like Michael said, you can make the playing field level. The other question, Michael, people worry about, can I get fired for filing a claim? You can, but it's going to be unlawful, and they're going to have a, probably a secondary case for what's called employment discrimination. So you're not allowed to be fired because of your race, your religion, your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, uh, your age. Uh, you know, if you're if you're uh, if you're pregnant and you need accommodation, these kind of things, and you're not allowed to be fired for retaliation for filing a workers' comp case or getting an attorney. And that's really uh, puts a chilling effect on people, that false belief that they're going to get hammered by their employer because they got a, a legal advice. And it prevents them from calling us or other law firms. And in the end, they end up losing lots of money, sometimes six figures, because they were stubborn. And they didn't really get that notion explained um, and debunked. They sort of have this percolating in their mind, oh my God, I'm I'm going to get in trouble and I like working here and I don't want to cause any waves, but it's your earning power on the line. And the sophisticated employers, most of them are at least on this basic level. They're not going to fire you uh, because you got legal advice. Now, there are occasions where we've seen and heard stories of having somebody uh, being treated differently after that. They're not going to overtly state, hey, we're upset you got advice, but they might start getting treated differently. Um, and so we tell them to keep a really careful journal with the date and things that are said or done. And um, in case this, you know, devolves into an employment discrimination matter where they get fired or suspended, for example, before an injury, no write ups, no disciplinary issues, nice, clean record. Uh, and then after the injury, all of a sudden you see late for work or uh, insubordination type of conduct or things like that. And you're, you're looking at these two saying, wow, there's a real disparity here. They look like a nice value worker beforehand. After the injury, they're getting written up left and right. So sometimes we'll refer that out to our colleague to see if there's a discrimination case there. Well, what happens if it's a union? Can you still get involved? If it's yeah, a we can, union worker? Yeah, we can. Some, some people just don't trust the, uh, 
the union attorneys that they're kind of assigned and um, for whatever reason, good or bad, true or untrue, they they want to get outside counsel. That that happens a lot. I've represented a lot of union workers um, and they have some extra protections under the law, which which helps them in the workers comp arena. Um, so, yeah, that happens on occasion where we get somebody who sort of wants to bypass the union attorney assigned to them. Maybe they they think they're not going to fight quite as hard or they're in alignment with the employer a little bit too much that makes them uncomfortable. So, yeah, we can we can absolutely represent union workers. Tell people the types of injuries that you normally work on. Again, this would run the whole gamut. I mean, we have traumatic brain injuries, um, a lot of low back injuries. The low back gets hurt probably the most just by the way we've evolved and the way our, our physical nature is. And, and uh, we're not really meant to be bending and lifting heavy, uh, heavy things. It puts a lot of load on the spine and force. So low back injuries, neck, of course. You know, lots of shoulder injuries, especially from lifting heavy things or repetitive use. Remember, you can have a, a sudden traumatic injury in workers' comp. You fell off a ladder, you lifted a box, and you had back pain. Or repetitive work trauma from day after day grind. Um, but we have knees, hips, everything. Burns, disfigurement, amputation cases, really everything. Wow. But I would say the low back um Low back is common. And believe it or not, a lot of lost finger cases. We get a lot of those, um, probably four or five every year, where somebody lost either, you know, one or multiple fingers from uh, from an accident at work. So that's common too. Do those get a very high settlement? It really depends. Uh, there's a there's a part of the workers' compact called specific loss. So if you lost a finger or you amputated an arm or a limb, you can get a certain amount of weeks of workers' comp checks plus a healing period, even if it doesn't take you out of work. Uh, normally, these things do take you out of work because they're serious injuries affecting your ability to do your job. So they're, so those cases, yeah, they can they can be high value. Same with the low back because the low back can can be tend to be permanent for a lot of people. Um, and there also can be a third party case with, especially with the, uh, the amputation cases where there, there may have been a defective machine oh. that didn't have a proper guard. And because they didn't have the proper guard, uh, there's a third party case, meaning a case not against the employer. Your remedy for that is your workers comp, but against another entity, for example, the manufacturer of the machine, uh, where you can get pain and suffering and, and other damages unlike workers comp. So we're always on the lookout for do our workers comp cases involve more than just comp? Maybe there's a third party angle here. A lot of firms will miss that and we make sure we don't. There's uh we're talking settlements today. So everyone talks about workers comp settlements. How do you get these settlements? How do you get these cases settled, Michael? Well, first, if somebody's doing it on their own, and I know it sounds self-serving, but it's just the truth and nothing but the truth. You got to, whether it's our firm or someone else, get lawyered up. You're not going to do well on your own with settlement. It's just, you know, unless you were out of work for two months and you're recovered and it's a, a small finite period, okay, you can try to negotiate that. But if it involves some permanent type of injury, you really need to get counsel involved. And we negotiate these by looking at a lot of factors their age, the extent of the injury, what they did for a living and how the injury affects their ability to earn money, um, whether they need surgery, what about medications, um, you know, all the, what about their residual earning power? Maybe they have a college degree and they could do sedentary work um, versus working with their hands. And so there's a lot of factors we look at to figure out, okay, what's the value of this case? It's always a certain range. It's never an exact science. Um, and you, you submit a demand saying, here's what we would like. And then you wait for an offer and you go back and forth. And sometimes we do a mediation with a workers' comp judge to try to help us settle a case. But um, it takes a careful analysis. And that's a lot of people try to get our uh, get that golden nugget from us without signing up. They're like, how much is my case worth? Uh, I'm like, well, 
you're taking 25 years of experience, a long time in school, a lot of law school, some student debt, and you're going to ask for all that wisdom for nothing. It's like, well, yes. the, other, the other part of that is we need their file to, to do it ethically, to make sure we, we know what the medical records say and we have the whole puzzle together. And uh, so, yeah, settlement is, I mean, really everybody asks about that because people don't want to be in the system. It's very demoralizing. You know, they're getting followed around sometimes. Their checks tend to be late. That they actually get, happens, Michael? Pardon me, Steve? That actually happens? They get followed around? Oh, yeah. There's surveillance. Now there's been a shift from following people around in public, you know, sitting outside their street in a dark tinted window vehicle or following them around to wherever they're going shopping. So there's still some of that. But now there's more of a social media investigation. And what are people posting? And do they have a side business? And is it on YouTube? And so they're really getting aggressive with trying to find out how active people are. Um, so, yeah, we always remind people, don't be posting when your case is active. You might put something and it gives the wrong idea. Then you have to explain it and it kind of puts you on defense. Um, so, yeah, surveillance is definitely part of the equation here. Can you... Uh... You don't have to disclose the company, but can you talk about some of the settlement amounts you get? Yeah, they really range, really. I mean, there's no uh, – every case is different. You know, you hear about that, like uh, the idea in real estate, every piece of land is unique. Every worker's comp case is unique, and someone might settle for 5000 because they sprained their back, but they're recovered. They were only out of work for, you know, a few months. And it's a small settlement, and, and uh, they're on their way. In other cases, it could be two hundred thousand, fifty thousand. We've settled a couple for seven figures, uh, but that's pretty rare in comp because we don't have a pain and suffering award. But you know, depending on the person's average weekly wage and the extent of disability, the numbers can can go pretty high. I would say ninety five percent of the cases are settled under two hundred fifty thousand. Uh, for various reasons. The workers' comp has a lot of tools to, to challenge people's benefits. And you always have doctors with different opinions. And so the, the awards, the settlements tend to be lower than people would like because they're not personal injury cases, but they really run a big range. I mean, you're talking from, you know, it could be $500, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of them in the $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 dollars range. So I would say that's probably 40 or 50 percent of them in that in that range you know we i wonder about some of these settlements we get michael we get so many questions still about what if you contract covid from a employee at work can you file on that yeah you can, can. Absolutely. That's a work-related illness. Um, you can file for benefits. You file what's called a claim petition, and it's going to get assigned to a workers' comp judge like every other case. And you're going to have to litigate it and prove your case. Uh, normally, you would do that by putting your client's testimony on uh, and also uh, taking the deposition of a doctor, maybe an internal medicine doctor or uh, could be a family doctor, could be a specialist with um trying to think of the the uh, specialty off the top of my head but you would need medical evidence to show within reasonable medical certainty that the doctor believes that so and so contracted covid at work and and so uh it's absolutely a viable case the strength of the case uh case by case of course but and they're very difficult because as we know covid is not something you can you can touch or feel and so a good defense lawyer is really going to vigorously cross-examine the injured worker about where they were in those days leading up to it and who they were exposed to and what stores they were at and did they have a mask on and what type of mask. And, I mean, you could just go on and on and on if if you wanted to be a pain defense lawyer and really, you know, <laughs> drill down on that. So uh, we actually didn't see as many as we thought during COVID. We had two or three cases. Um, but a lot of them were short-term illness where somebody was sick for a few months 
and maybe they got short-term disability or unemployment comp, something like that in the interim, which didn't really make the workers' comp case very valuable to pursue. So a lot of them were, were smaller cases. Michael, if somebody dies from an injury, does that go into a different area of law? No, we have what's called death claims. And uh, so you're entitled to the, or the estate is entitled to, you know, a certain amount for funeral costs. And then um, if there was a widow or widower, they could receive benefits up until, oh. they, up until they remarry, for example. Um, if there's kids involved, there's a whole chart and you have to really look at it carefully. Really, the issue is dependence. Was somebody dependent financially on the injured worker who who perished? And and then you look at the chart and figure out who's entitled to what. So, yeah, we, we, we've had a couple of those along the way, sadly. Okay, it worked for good. Good, did they? You know, you used to tell me, Michael, oh, I guess maybe eight or nine months ago when we started having viewers would ask about COVID. And you would tell me how hard it is to prove. So we've come a long way. Yeah. Yep. It's absolutely right. Yeah. There's a there's a little surge right now. Unfortunately, uh, you know, not to not to preach, but people need to be careful because uh, you know it's not completely gone. It's still with us in different right. different degrees. So you know, we're still probably going to have some more work-related cases, you know, down the road here. Uh, somebody had asked a couple of weeks ago, what happens if you're going to work and somebody attacks you, jumps you, and harms you? Is that work-related? Unfortunately, no, if you're just commuting. For example, if you're just going to your Let's say you have a traditional job, nine to five, you leave your home and you go to a set place every day, a business, an office building, and you're commuting. If you're hurt on that commute, it's not a work injury. Um, now, if you're at work already and you're going for a lunch break and you're on the property, that might be different. That might, that might be a work injury. So commuting is not part of the scheme here for work-related injuries, but Keep in mind, there's a thing called special uh, a special assignment. For example, if your supervisor or, or the owner of your business said, "Hey, we need you to go drive down to uh, the hardware store. We need we need new uh, light bulbs for the uh, kitchen." That's a specific mission. You're not commuting at that point. You're driving for a work related purpose because your boss asked you to, and you get rear ended or t boned or assaulted in the store. That could be a work-related injury because you're in the course and scope of your employment. But if you're on your way to work, usually that's not. Usually that's just commuting, and so that would not be covered. There's an area that people aren't going to want to hear about. What if you're an independent contractor? Yeah, this comes up a lot, Steve. Independent contractors are not uh, covered by the workers' compact. Yeah. You have to be an employee. But not everybody who is called an independent contractor really is one. A lot of times uh, an employer shouldn't use that word, but the entity will have you sign a document saying you're an independent contractor. But that's not the end of the equation for the workers' comp judges and the, and the court system. They're going to look at control. And the more control they have over you, and maybe you're using their, their car and their tools, and they tell you where to go and where to be at a certain time, the more control there is, the more likely you're going to be deemed an employee. The more the lack of control, you know, you have more control over things, the more likely you're going to be deemed an independent contractor. So we have cases that are really complicated where it's it's a really tough call. It seems like uh, there's factors in one column, factors in the other column, and then the judge has to decide the issue. And then if you prove you're an employee, you go to the next phase of the case which is disability, you know, didn't, did they get hurt? What's the extent of the injury, et cetera. So usually we try to bifurcate them, meaning let's just deal with this one issue alone. Were they employee or not? Because if the answer is no, that's it. It's over. Michael, our shows go by so fast. 
Uh, the good news is you have another show the last Tuesday of this month at 10 o'clock. Uh, tell people how they can contact your office and your website. Sure. 215-206-9068. That's our phone number. 215-206-9068. On the web at cardamonelaw.com. That's C-A-R-D-A. M O N E L A W. You can also get there by My Philly with a Y, workerscomp.com. That's My Philly, workerscomp.com. And we have a, a blog that a lot of people read. It's, it's at PA workinjury.info. And uh, so, yeah, you can reach us seven days a week. We get back to people quickly and we're, we're happy to help if anybody needs it. One of the finest workers comp law firm in the state of Pennsylvania. Michael, we'll see you in about three weeks. Sounds Thank great. You so much. And uh, as always, all of our shows are sponsored by the Michael Cardamon Law Firm. We'll be back with you next week with more Ask the Experts. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in today to the Ask the Expert show on W4CY Radio and Talk 4 TV. Tune in next week and every week to hear more from our experts on personal injury, insurance, air condition repairs, estate planning, Medicare, and many other topics in the areas of legal, health, financial, and home improvement. See you next week.